I learned to read very early, very very young, and my father was uh, fond of writing doggerel verses, so the children, the two of us, we learned, we, we started writing books very early. He would print them out and we would illustrate them, and m many times the text was in verse. But I started reading um, poems that I found I remember my grandmother, who wasn't a bookish woman, had a tiny little anthology. It was physically an, a small object, as I remember, of beloved poems or, you know, some really sort of comprehensive uh, title of that kind. And I remember reading Blake's Little Black Boy, and I remember reading the song from Cymbeline, Fear No More, The Heat of the Sun. And I must have been five years old, four years old, little. But I heard those poems. I often didn't know, I, with Blake's poem, I knew obviously nothing of the historical background of the poem, but the, the cry from the heart to my ear, that I could hear, and I thought, these are the people I, I am speaking to, and this is why my everyday life is such a catastrophe. Um, and I remember a little later than that, having in my mind a sort of private, crucial competition for the greatest poem ever written, of course, based on the sample I had then read. And the finalists were Blake's Little Black Boy and Swanee River. And if you think about it, the, they're tonally very like. The same solitary voice raised in lament, essentially, and grief. Um, that tone reached me very quickly. Um, the songs from the plays of Shakespeare were very different, um, but I, and I, m many times I didn't understand some of the words, and I had no idea that they they filled what 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 need they filled in the play. I don't even think I knew that they were parts of plays, but I read them. Hypnotically, even after I had memorized them, I kept reading them. And as I got older, I read constantly much fiction, which I still read to divert myself, to be happy. When I want to be happy, I read a novel. Um, but in my early teens and mid-teens, I would just read deep into the night all those poets who are commonly anthologized. I, I came from uh, a family committed to education, but not particularly literary. Um, my father's interest was much more history and government. My mother liked the arts, but I wouldn't say she was informed or a tremendous judge. But they were very pleased with my early sense of vocation. There was a tremendous parental support for that. It was a, one of those sort of child dreams that oftentimes gets knocked out of the child and replaced by something else, sometimes something equally grand. Um, from the time I had that little poetry competition in my head between Swanee River and Little Black Boy, I, early, always, I knew that what I wanted was to write. And I digressed occasionally. There was a period in which I wanted to be an actress which I later realized was simply that I wanted to be applauded. I had no gift for theater at all. I was a, I had a 
good memory. I could memorize lines, but I was a very wooden performer. I was cleaving so hard to an evolving self. The idea of subordinating that self to a role was <laughs> completely impossible. So I, my mother, with whom I was often at war in that period, kept saying, darling, darling, it's such a shame you want to be an actress because you're such a fine writer and painter. And she left the rest unsaid, and that made me more stubborn. I just, but that was very brief. And then I went back to what I dreamed of. I mean, I didn't know what you did to become a writer with a book, but I wrote poems from the time I was in my early, early teens. I submitted my first book when I was 13 or 14. It was, I mean, of course, sent back. And poems to magazines. And I persisted. I was not a successful adolescent. Uh, I, I seemed strange to the other children, and they were nasty to me. Um, I became quite withdrawn, and then I became uh, severely anorexic, which is why I was taken out of high school. Um, even though my plans for myself were all intellectual, I thought I'm going to be an artist, and I'm going to be naturally a professor. Uh, but the professor part happened, well, happened in a sort of backdoor way. Um, it was a very, very, very important event for me because it got me into psychoanalysis, which became important to my thought. I feel as though I learned how to think in psychoanalysis. Um, and I recovered a self that could be in the world. Very complicated and probably not a uh, subject for this inquiry, but um, obviously a sort of repudiation of my mother whose will was overpowering and whose uh, sense of ownership of her young was very intense and I needed a way of pushing her away and I also found unnerving the idea of beginning to have a body that was differentiated from other bodies. I wanted to be a pure soul and I thought this is the most amazing strategy I will become a pure soul. I will liberate myself from the constrictions and earthliness of flesh. It was a great plan. <laughs> the problem was that you die of it. And when I realized that, I mean, it, there was nothing in me self-destructive. I was trying to create a self. I just chose badly, and I was awfully lucky that I had an analyst gifted enough to talk me down off the tree branch. And I started taking poetry workshops at that time in night school at the School of General Studies, which was thrilling. And so I had a world of people interested in what I was interested in, and I worked very hard, and I, I had amazing teachers very, very good at drawing out of quite disparate talents what was native to them. Um, first, Lanny Adams, who used to smoke about eight cigarettes at a time, you know, that one would be burning its way toward her fingers, and we'd all watch mesmerized to see if the ash would fall. And then she'd put it down and start another, and there, there were these <laughs> cigarettes burning all over the room. And she was not a poet whose work I particularly revered, 
I, I, in fact, I didn't know it until she became my teacher. But she was a very great teacher. Um, she, she had about her an air of high seriousness and devotion that was attractive to me. And Stanley Kunitz the same. There was a sense of you subordinated your ego to the needs of the poem. It was very attractive. And he, he taught, he didn't teach it, but he manifested and we copied the idea of a kind of profound patience and um, the capacity to be dissatisfied with something that one was doing for a very long time and still reapproach it. And also uh, he taught, he, he, sh he somehow made clear that we were going to need, beside patience, very tough hide because there are so many forms of humiliation. Um, you know, there's neglect, which is the obvious one. There's praise for characteristics that you think are not yours and that you deplore. And to be praised for things that you deplore is, is quite punishing. Um, and there's neglect, um, the kind that pats you on the head and moves on to the more interesting things. And all of it just cycles, you know, through, you know, what you, you you ascend for a certain period. You can feel the pins moving on the board. And then all of a sudden, there you are, target practice for people. And you have to just live through all of it, all of it, and not be destroyed. I let them know that if they're projecting onto me a kind of, um, serenity of um, acknowledged accomplishment, that they, they're quite mistaken, that that is not the experience of being in the world and that it's all struggle. It's the whole life is struggle and euphoria. And that's why there's daily life, which is an enormous consolation. You know, just the tasks of daily life, cooking dinner, gardening, going out with friends. It's often um, a, a, a torment, a place of suffering, harrowing. Things aren't going well, things aren't going well, and then things are great, and then struggle again. There's a period of kind of tranquility after some large thing has been completed. And it's, it's that wonderful point uh, many people talk about this, the moment of having written. And you don't, have to, you don't have to do it for a while. That's very lovely. Uh, but then mm, there's a sense of the strangest anxiety, but anxiety builds. The sense that an account must be invented. Uh, I still don't completely understand that. I've spent a lot of time thinking about all these issues and talking about them. I feel alive when I'm doing it and much less alive when I'm not doing it. I write to discover meaning. I want experience to mean something. It's less a matter of who I am than that that idea that nothing should be wasted, that something, something must come of it. And writing is a kind of revenge against circumstance, too. Bad luck, loss, pain. Um, if you make something out of it, then you've no longer been bested by 
these events. It was a miracle. It was one of the greatest gifts of my life. Um, I had long thought that to be an artist involved, um, and I think there's writers who make this case, the repudiation of the world. You, um, you channel all of these vital energies into only this one thing. Um, you're not distracted by pleasure or, or uh, ordinariness. You uh, don't do any job that would use those same pieces of your mind. And that was, to me, temperamentally congenial. Repudiation was something I was very good at. Um, so I lived uh, in my 20s, mainly fending off, uh, not experience, because it was a time of great, you know, love affairs and so on, but um, professional work of a kind that would, I thought, draw on my vital juices. I was a secretary, which did not do that. Um, but my writing life at that point was spent sitting in front of a piece of white paper at a typewriter, completely paralyzed. And I would think, I've got to write something. I've got, and I would write the, and then push really hard and tree would come out. But I could, everything was dead. I had, I had, I had exhausted a mode of writing in my first book. I had no new sound to make. You have to hear first a message from the ear, a kind of sound, a, a, a phrase. I had no, nothing to go on. And I kept uh, doing less and less because I thought I wasn't sacrificing enough, I wasn't renouncing enough. And finally, it occurred to me that I wasn't going to be an artist, that this dearest wish of my heart would not be answered, and I thought I'd better think of something to do. And I had had um, offers of teaching jobs, one semester, year-long things, based on my book. Um, and I'd turned them down because poets shouldn't teach. I don't know how I knew that. Where was, where, I don't know where that came from, but it was a conviction. It was basically a sentence, a nervous sentence that began, poets shouldn't, and then you could fill in any blank that was serviceable at the time. I did, a, I was invited to go to Vermont to d take part in a colloquium. And John Berriman was among those invited, and he was a hero. I wanted to meet him. Um, and the minute I got to Vermont, I, I felt I'm supposed to live here. And I had never had that feeling. I, home to me wasn't where I grew up, Long Island. It certainly wasn't New York City, where I then lived. And then it wasn't, emphatically wasn't Provincetown, where I lived for two years and was living at the time. But I got to Vermont and I thought, this is where I'm supposed to be. And these, the people who were my hosts taught at Goddard College, a hippie institution back then. And they kept saying at the parties uh, during the colloquium, you should come here and teach. And finally I had an epiphany and I said, yes. And I didn't, I was so uh, naive in this regard. I didn't think that these English, I didn't realize they weren't empowered to offer me a job. They were just being pleasant. Uh, we were all liking each other. But I became then quite committed to the idea, and four days before the semester started, a job was found. One semester deal. I moved to Vermont. I moved into a rooming house with a bathroom down the hall. Um, 
on a, what passed in Vermont for a highway, just uh, maybe three quarters of a mile from the school. And the minute I started teaching, I became happy. I was happy in Vermont. I, my in, intuition was right. I think I know why, but... Um, and teaching released me. It was one of the most dramatic, transformative experiences of my life, and entirely positive. It didn't have, I mean, having a baby was a something like that, but it initially was terrifying and horrible. Um, but this was simply, I loved what I was doing. I, I found my students fascinating, um, gifted. Uh, I was not much older than they were. I, I started writing. I started writing with a fluency I had never experienced. I started writing the poems that were in that second book, which are, I think, really the first real poems I wrote that weren't just um, formal practices. Um, and that feeling about teaching has been constant. I still love teaching, and I still love my students. And some of my students have gone on to very great careers of different kinds, um, <clears throat> which especially pleases me when we're talking about undergraduates. There's a poet named Claudia Rankin, brilliant, brilliant poet, who was in the first class I taught at Williams. I've known Claudia since she was 20 years old. They'll make me a better writer. They will, if they're making discoveries, they're hearing sounds I can't hear, and reading their work I begin to hear because it, there's still lots that I can do for them. But I get excited by the freshness of their minds. Um, I have, there are a number of people my own age who, who are, have done, are doing extraordinary, remarkable work. But I feed more on the young because of the sense of, the sounds they're making are different, new, new to my ear. One of the things I did later was I started um, editing a first book series, which was a discovery akin to teaching for me. I, I would get these cartons with 100 and something books, finalists, and some of the judges for these competitions would ask to read 10 books. I wanted to see everything that had in the idea of the reader, readers, screeners, some merit, and I copied um, a design Michael Collier had put in place for the Bakeless Prize, which I judged one year, of having the judge choose uh, younger poets who would screen. And it's terrific because you have people then reading these books and making judgments about what to pass on who are people whose sensibilities you trust. Um, so when I started doing this for the Yale Younger Poets Prize before I was a teacher at Yale, um, I had young poets screening for me and I, I discovered in these boxes great artists. I mean, phenomenal artists. And one of them was Peter Streckfuss, um, whose rhythms and constructions were deeply in my mind. And I realized that I, I, I felt I was ripping him off. 
And I went back and reread the book. This was some years afterward. And I, none of his language was, I mean, it, it wasn't, but I knew where I had gotten what I, I knew that I had gotten where I was because of him. And I called him and I said, I feel I, I must apologize. You, I hope that you don't feel that these poems that I'm writing are your poems. And I said, I checked, and there's no duplication of phrasing or even meter. I mean, they're different, but I know. And he said, oh, this is wonderful, Louise. This is what should be between poets, that there's a kind of active cross-pollination. I don't know that I would be so generous. I'm very custodial. You know, if I, if I see a phrase of mine in someone else's poem, I'm not happy. I, I want to write a letter to the editor. I wrote that, but I don't. The Bollingen means something. That meant a lot. And I, I felt proud. But the problem is if you get a prize and you're not writing anything, or you're writing stuff that seems so bizarre that you don't know what to make of it, then your feelings about yourself as an artist are completely... Um, driven by, are you still an artist? That query, and the fact that you have been or once were, or that book was good, but what have you got to show for yourself now? It, it, the discrepancy is sometimes very painful. And a lot of prizes, I mean, the judges are just human beings, and they have agendas, and they have feuds, and they have loyalties. And if you know something about the world, it's very, I'm sure this is true in other fields. You can see that so-and-so is getting this because the judge is actually ferociously jealous of someone else who properly should have gotten it. Things like nasty businesses like that. So worldly honor, it makes existence in the world easier. I mean, it makes, it puts you in a position to have a good job. Um, it means that you can, or you could in a different economy, charge large fees to get on an airplane and perform, but and, and for all that, I'm very grateful. Um, but as, a, as an emblem of what I, wa what I want I, I, is, not ha is not capable of being had in my lifetime. I want to live after I die in that ancient way. And there's no knowing whether that will happen. And there will be no knowing no matter how many blue ribbons I have plastered to my corpse. I hate the word, but, but it's true that something sometimes visits and other times doesn't. I mean, I feel definitely that I wish I felt otherwise, but I feel as though there has to be some catalyst, some inspiration, some, all of a sudden there's a phrase in your head, where does that thing come from? I don't know. And because I don't know, I don't know how to have more of them. Sometimes there'll be lines in, in my head for two years before I know how to use them. I, I don't know in what context what I hear can be liberated. And so initially, they seem a great gift because you have these two beautiful lines. And then they become a torment because you have these two beautiful lines that aren't in themselves a poem. And you have no idea what kind of house to build for them, around them. And there have been periods in my life when I've been, when my first thought in the morning has been that piece of language, my last thought at night, the piece of language, but it's like a, 
whip. It's a punishment because I can't do it. And then in each of those cases, ultimately, I could write a poem that made a world. Um, and every, every so often, after I was 50, I started writing books very rapidly. This happened in the, in the maybe four or five books. The Wild Iris was written, except for about five poems, it was written in six weeks, eight weeks. Uh, Vita Nova, the same, The Seven Ages, was written in something like yeah, six weeks. I mean, you know, just like four or five poems a day, and then you sh the day before you start, you're complete blank, and then all of a sudden, six weeks later, you have a book. It's a hard, and then you're very tired, and you get sick. Um, and then some of the other village life was different. Um, Averna was written in two halves. Um, the first kind of slow, dogged, hopeless. Then hiatus of about two years, and then two years later, the second half, very fast. And then village life was sort of ideal. It was a steady writing for about a year, and a sense of great... Um, curiosity and contentment and richness without any of the tempestuousness of that very rapid you give up sleep thing. I, I know it sounds like some, something that should be medicated, but um, it, it, I, it doesn't feel like mania to me. It's very, it's very specific to this one event. Um, anyway, it's certainly not going on now. I think what I feel is trust in my editorial capabilities. I know that if I get something on the page, I can do something with it. I'll know what to do. Um, but yeah, I do. It, I, my bedtime story when I was very, very little, my father used to tell my sister and me the story of St. Joan without the burning. And, you know, she heard voices, and I, I was very uh, accustomed to the idea that one heard voices. I hear language. It's not like a angel speaking to me, but language comes. And I, it, it all, I don't know how to control it, but um, I'm very grateful when it happens. And I've never felt that I've been wrong about one of those little gifts. But then a lot of what I do is not, it doesn't come about that way. It, 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 it's a sort of one poem leads to the next in, in un, unexpected ways. But when some, some switch has been flipped and you're, you're in the on mode and then you're off. And every time it's off, you feel as though this is the, this is the true silence. This is the end of all speech. It's a horrible feeling. And it still dogs me. I mean, I've been talking a long time right now, for example, but, um, varies a lot, but mainly classical, mainly opera or song. Um, when I was first, this is really, this is my favorite of these stories, writing Averno. It was a poem I was working on, a sort of uh, September 11th poem in multi-parts. And I had it, I knew how I wanted the poem to feel because I'd been reading, I'd finished reading a murder mystery uh, by Reginald Hill. I read a lot of murders called On Beulah Heights. The heroine of the book, you encounter her first 
as a child, and then she becomes a singer, and she wants to do her own translation of Kindertotenlieder. And the translation uh, starts to weave through the text, and it's hypnotic. And that sound, the Hill's libretto that his heroine contrives, um, drilled itself into my head, and I started. I was. It was in my head when I was working on these poems, and I showed one of them to my friend Frank Bedart, who's a very good reader, and he said, "You've been listening to Das Lied von der Erde," and I said, "No, but I've been reading Reginald Hill uh, on Kindertotenlieder," and he said, "You sound like Mahler." And I said, I didn't have the music. I would never listen to Kindertotenlieder because it has such bad karma. Everybody who had anything to do with it lost a child. I, I couldn't afford that. But uh, Das Lied von der Erde, I, he, Frank said, we have to get you the record. And we got a beautiful recording. I felt that that music was showing me how to write this book. Um, even the poems that don't sound anything like it. And so I listened to Das Lied von der Erde all the time when I was home, um, every day, nothing else. And then finished my book, and then now I, I, I can't I can't listen to it because I've, I've over-listened. Years will have to elapse. Um, and there, the, the, there was a kind of correspondence that a, a good reader could pick up on. With The Wild Iris, I spent two years listening to um, Don Giovanni, truly nonstop. Um, <clears throat> which may have been hard on my family because I was living with a kid and a husband at the time. But, and my only reading was flower catalogs. I was getting really passionate about the garden and I was writing nothing and I thought two years, two and a half years, I thought, no wonder you can't write anything. All you do is listen to Mozart and read about begonias. I mean, <laughs> you expect. Um, and finally I thought, I, I just, I didn't know what to do and I was walking in the garden and doing a little desultory weeding and I thought, well, I'll try to write a poem f spoken by a flower. And immediately I thought, well, within two days, when I wrote another, I thought, this, this, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> and it was still Don Giovanni and the flower catalogs, but all of a sudden they'd fused into this um, form. But there was no sense building up to it of anything but a um, tragic falling off of original potential. It has to it has to connect to some neural pre-existing code. There because not every piece of music does it. And then there's the there's music that I listen to obsessively that doesn't do it. I spend a lot of time listening to Sam Cooke's songbook. And and it was all I could listen to, but it didn't turn into poems and books, or it hasn't yet. I would say that not writing for two years is a very deep experience of failure. Um, but I don't know that it's essential. I just know it's my experience. It's hard to say what's essential. And you tend to make a, a, a sort of case study of yourself and the things that have been true of your life, you generalize. 
but I can't say that that kind of impossibility, that sense of stagnation and silence, I can't say that they're crucial. They seem to be what happens to me. Um, I think if, if failure and success are having to do with what the world says, that's a whole other thing. And, you know, there have been books I've been very, that I think of as among my best that have been, you know, reviewed scornfully and deplored. Never fiction. I mean, fiction is for me like, it's like cooking. It's pure pleasure. I don't want to sully it by involving myself. And I don't think I'm a storyteller. Um, I like writing essays. I have to, it seems, be ang angry at something to write an essay. Though I've written now 10 extended forwards, introductions to books by young writers. And I have about five or six other essays unpublished. I, I feel as though the balance is wrong. I, I, don't know, I don't see a book in that. But I, I would like to write another prose book. It was, um, it, it, whenever I'm working on an essay, I'm, I'm usually in a fairly good mood the way you're in a good mood when work is regular and you're thinking and you have a desk and it has paper in it and there's words on the paper and you go back to the paragraph before and you take up the thread. That's just lovely. But I don't have any ideas for an essay now, and maybe I won't write any more of them. The forewords kind of knocked me out. Um, it was the only part of the judging that was really hard because I wanted to do, I wanted to do right by these poets. I wanted to say what was about them so distinctive and unique um, and important. And to do that year after year after year is very hard to even isolate. It's easier to do it when you don't like something because all the reasons for your not liking something are immediately available to you. But when you like something, it's you, the vocabulary becomes very reductive. Things like, wow, Lord, God. <laughs> Uh, exclamatory and brief remarks don't make a foreword. And that's why, you know, a lot of these forewords that people write are just say things like, another, Im an important voice in American poetry. Really? What kind? What's, what, what sets it apart? If someone's really a beginner, then you simply try to isolate the moments when the the poem seems alive, as opposed to inert. And, you know, if you can see from the first line where it's going and then it goes there, it's a dead thing. It makes, it takes you nowhere you don't know already. And if it does so in elegant metaphors, so what? This poem has already been written 3,000 times. But when you see something that is unprecedented, and if you can show the person that. So that's one level of teaching, but then once, the, once people become really artists, young artists, but artists, you, there's no, it, it's not doing it better according to some formula. It's where does the poem wilt a little? Where is it um, a most conventional or generic? And can that moment be addressed and reinvented so that that taint of the generic will be forever um, obliterated? It's that that you try to do. Um, and it's uh, 
It's a fascinating problem and different for every poem um, to try to feel out what separates this from a, a memorable work of art and how could it become that memorable work of art. And it's what you do on your own work too, but it's the same thing with theirs, only they're making a different kind of poem, a different kind of sound that looks different on the page. Their concerns are different. So imaginatively, you enter the universe of that poem. Um, and in a way, you do that when you read great work. But there's something wonderful about having that kind of immersion when the thing is still malleable. It's thrilling, and poems can be transformed. And the students, of course, or young writers, get very excited when that happens. But every, every one of those books that I chose and then sometimes worked on with the people had different strengths, different problems. They were e each utterly unique. Jay Hopler is nothing like Peter Streckfuss, and neither of them is anything like Richard Sykin. All those books had different problems. I teach the people who come to me, and they come to me because they want to write poems. I think probably everybody, I think probably every 21-year-old has 10 poems to write. Um, what makes a poet is not just talent, it's hunger. And it's a hunger so profound and uh, un unkillable that it, it keeps you going for 50 and 60 years. You can't know of a young writer if that hunger exists. And will it survive being mutilated, pissed on. Um, there's a mixed figure for you. Um, <laughs> you don't know that. But you try to give the skills that would be of use were that to happen. Okay, read poetry. Read. Um, Keep yourself open to alternatives. Um, but that's, I think the, the problem with the question is that it really it depends on the person. So your answer will be, uh, in, to some extent, uh, based on your perception of that person's capacity sure. and um, hunger and psychology. Some people are already reading so much that to tell them to read more, their voices will be drowned. They already are going to read more. They're gonna read every waking hour. So you remind them to um, live in the world. Sometimes people have in mind the kind the kinds of renunciations I practiced myself and instinctively am drawn to. Women who say they're not going to have children, they're not going to have professions, they're not going to go to law school, they're not going to go because they want to just write poems. And I think your poems, the ones that are yours and not skillful clones of existing poems, um, will come about through your having lived the life that most closely enacts your own passions. And if you spurn them, you'll never write. I mean, you may write, but you won't make anything. So I. I push them toward yeses, maybe more than I should. <laughs>